So we are out here in Pretoria and we're looking at these gorgeous trees, the uh, jacaranda trees, which are super famous and super pretty um, at this time of year. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to share this with you guys and I'm going to do a bit of sketching as well. So to give you guys a bit of background on these amazing trees, um, each year from around late September to about November, um, jacaranda trees go into bloom all across South Africa and they are particularly abundant in Pretoria and Johannesburg. So we went to check them out actually a few weeks ago in October and visually they just weren't, they were kind of blooming but they weren't great kind of thing. Um, and then we went away and stuff. So this really felt like the last opportunity that we could try and uh, see these trees. And luckily we, we drove over to Pretoria. It's about a 45 minute drive from where we are in Johannesburg. And yeah, as you can see, they just look absolutely gorgeous. So I'm so happy that we managed to get to go and see them. Um, obviously they're all around Johannesburg as well, but uh, Pretoria is particularly synonymous with the tree. It's actually affectionately known as jacaranda city so but the jacaranda isn't actually indigenous to south africa so they were introduced here in 1888 i believe and uh, in Celia's street in pretoria there's a plaque actually commemorating the first two jacaranda trees that were planted there by someone called jd Celia's. so the saplings were actually imported from brazil and the tree is native to central and south america but as mentioned, they've just become such a strong part of the the city's culture. So there's even a, a local radio station called Jacaranda FM. And as I said, the Pretoria is kind of known uh, colloquially as Jacaranda City. So the word Jacaranda is believed to mean fragrant in native South American and the trees are known for these spectacular purple blossoms. But there, there are also white jacaranda trees as well. So they're, they're much rarer here in South Africa, but you can see them on certain streets, such as Herbert Baker Street in Pretoria. We didn't actually get a chance to go over and see the white ones. But yeah, they're just kind of magical, these trees. And actually, apparently, some um, university students believe that if a jacaranda flower falls on your head during exam time, uh, you'll pass all of your exams. So uh, yeah, if only it was that easy, hey? <laughs> so um, in 2001, though, these iconic trees were actually declared as like a category three invader. So they kind of compete with the indigenous species. So it's against the law for any trees to be newly planted. However, the, the jacaranda trees that are already here are allowed to stay so they're just so beloved that even though they're on the hit list um for being um an invader <laughs> they can't actually be forcefully removed like other foreign plants have been yeah so that's a bit about the jacaranda trees i ho hopefully that was interesting for you guys um so as i was sitting in the back of my car because i'd actually forgotten my stool I was sketching away and this the man from the house that we were parked outside of came out and was like, oh, what, what are you doing? And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and he came over to see and he was like, I was out here yesterday with my easel painting these trees. Do you want to come and see? I've got a whole gallery in here. We were like, yeah, okay, cool. So he invited us into his house and as you can see, he is a full-on artist. And not only is he an artist, he's a teacher as well. So he's got this amazing space with all of his oil paintings and acrylic paintings and watercolour paintings all over the walls, some of them for sale. He does plein air painting as well as in his studio. And then he's got this amazing space where he hosts workshops as well, teaching other people how to paint in oil, acrylic and watercolour. And this is just like the most fabulous house I've ever seen. I fell in love with it. It's just incredible. And um, Neil Moss, who is the uh, the artist that we whose house we're in right now, um, yeah, he was just such a dude. So um, I'm gonna keep my eye on his Facebook page or his website, and uh, hopefully I can come and join one of his workshops because his his paintings just spectacular, and I just absolutely 
love, love, loved his uh, paintings of the jacaranda trees. And what a place to, to live as an artist, hey? With every year, these jacarandas coming out in full bloom, just grabs his easel, walks outside his door, and he can paint the, the view of the street. So, yeah, it was one of those magical moments that happen sometimes when you're doing urban sketching or plein air sketching or travel sketching, and people do actually come over to you and chit-chat, and all kinds of wonderful things can come from there. So, um... You know, recently I asked you guys what scares you about urban sketching and some of you said being out in public or people approaching you, you know, that kind of thing. But this this type of situation, me and Duncan were just grinning from ear to ear because it was just such a wonderful thing that happened and we were just blown away by seeing Neil's gallery and his workshop and meeting him and it was just brilliant. And then... I went back outside, carried on with my sketch, and then we, we went off for some lunch. So it was just a really beautiful day. So when we got home, I decided that I'd quite like to spend some time sketching more jacarandas, maybe sketching the same scene, swatching out some purples, that kind of thing, and just um, just spending a bit more time with it because I just loved this scene so much. And, you know, it's, it's great doing urban sketching and stuff and doing it on the fly, but I find that I actually learn quite a lot by purposefully studying these things when I get home as well, or at home, should I say. So here you can see, this is my watercolour mixing chart. I do have a video on how to make this. It's not great, but you get the gist. And this is all the different colours I can make from this St. Petersburg White Knight set of 14 paints. It's staggering how many colours you can achieve. And that's just with mixing two colours together. So I took this chart and I was trying to see what, which um, colour, which mixture was most closest to the kind of purple lilac I would say the lilac -y shade of the jacaranda trees that I was looking at and I thought you know I'd I'd mix those colors up but also just try out some of the other shades that I have in my mongrel set which is a mixture of water uh, Windsor and Newton and Daniel Smith and Jackson's art so yeah this is just my kind of color studies and just figuring out what what colors make what purples so I highly recommend you guys do this this is a perfect thing to have in your sketchbook little notes of which um, pigments make or which colours make, make what kind of mixtures. This is, yeah, this is such a fun, interesting thing to do and it's such a great way of learning. Honestly, from making that watercolour mixing chart, I think whenever it was, maybe a year ago or so, my knowledge of how to mix colours just went up exponentially. So if you haven't made a watercolour mixing chart with your paints yet, I really cannot emphasize enough how useful a thing that is to do to really learn your paints and what they can do. So once I finished messing around with uh, my purple mixtures, I decided to go in for another painting. So I'm just using a still from one of the videos that I took. I didn't actually take many photos when I was there, which was a bit weird, but I mainly took videos. So I just sort of paused the video and 
tried to sketch the, the similar sort of scene um, as to where we were parked, just to mess around with different techniques and see what happens, you know. And I'll probably do this sketch like maybe 10 more times if I wanted to, you know, just to try different ways of doing things until I, you know, figure out one that maybe I really like. Or maybe I really like all of them, I don't know. I'm going to check with you guys at the end of this video as to which one of these you prefer. Yeah, I'm just doing a lot of wet and wet here. I had my mop brush out there, just my cheapie from uh, De La Rowney, and just doing some wet and wet skies and trying to get the the kind of colours, yeah, colour of the sky and the trees in, as the purple bits as well as the green bits, just because this is a nice, like, base layer. And later on I'll come back in and define some of the shapes a bit more, but... It's kind of nice to have those hazy colours just in the background. I really like that effect. So there's quite a nice one-point perspective going on in this scene as well, which I'm quite enjoying. So I'm um, just really trying to emphasise that road going off into the distance. Uh, that, that was quite fun. And also trying to get the effect of the trees, you know, the much larger and bolder in the foreground and then they sort of trail off into the background and and all those kind of details really help establish that sense of the scene receding off into the distance. So I'm trying to remember that actually the details in the foreground are just a lot darker, a lot sharper than they would be in the background. So always trying to keep that in mind. And here I'm playing with the shadow shapes. So I'm trying to show that the shadow on the grass is a darker green, the shadow on the path is a darker brown, and the shadow on the road is like a darker grey. I mean, in this case, I've, I've done it a bit more purple, but I just thought that was interesting. So I really wanted to try and play with that. I think it can be quite tempting with shadows just to sort of paint paint them in like a just a dark grey colour or something like that but I think if you can spend the time and actually appreciate the shadow is just perhaps a darker colour of the thing that it the, the shadow is on then that can make quite a nice effect. So here I'm just using my 0.2 fine liner in my um, urban sketch I was using my Sailor Feud um, few day fountain pen which was really fun to be really loose with and that's what I was going for in my actual sketch on location I just wanted it to be quick I didn't want to keep Duncan waiting around too long I wanted it to be quick I wanted it to capture the moment and I wanted it to move on so that was what I was really trying to achieve but when I got home I was like I wonder what it would be like if I just spent a little bit extra time not like you know crazy like two hours on it but just a little bit of extra time in a more controlled environment just to see what I would do differently or how it could look, that kind of thing. It was just, just an experiment, really. So I am using my brand new camera here, guys. I took the plunge and I finally upgraded to a nice Sony camera. It's still not a big boy, but it's um, a, a really decent camera. Uh, the ZV-E10, if anyone's wondering. And I can actually now record in 4K, which is pretty mind-blowing. And as my brother pointed out the other day, he was like, is your screen even 4K? And I was like, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, if you have 4K capabilities, then, um, you know, please do set your YouTube settings accordingly and appreciate this video in its full glory. I didn't actually realize, but YouTube kind of sets your, your playback quality on automatic. And I was watching the, uh, my last video back and I was like, why is the quality really not good? I'm using a really awesome camera. And actually, if you go to the bottom right hand corner of the video, there's a little cog there. And I saw that it was on automatic and it was on 480p, which is like half of the quality that, you know, of HD sort of thing. So, um, yeah, do click that cog and just see what setting you're on. Especially if you're at home on the Wi-Fi, then, you know, by all means, pump that up to 1080p or 4K even and really get the crispness of the video. 
I am having a few focusing issues at the moment where the camera is focusing on my hand rather than page, but I am sure I will get that ironed out for you guys very soon. <laughs> So now I'm just going in with my smaller brush, my Rosemary & Co Travel Dagger Brush. As you guys know, I love this brush. And I'm just adding some details, but I'm not really, I'm not loving it at this stage. I quite like the trees, how I've got them spaced out in perspective. So I, I like that they are a bit more spread out. I think it was a bit messy in my urban sketch because I just did it so super quick. But I spent a bit more time on spacing the trees and I think that is better in this sketch for sure. Also, the jacarandas just have such wonderful shapes as trees as well, so um, I'm not sure I got that as well as I could have done in this sketch, but maybe the, the front one on the right-hand side has got more of a, a good jacaranda shape to it, but that's something I'd like to play with. I think I'd actually just like to do a study of a singular jacaranda tree with lots of white space around it. I think that would be really fun on, like, a larger piece of paper or something. Um, yeah, I just... This subject matter has just got a lot more, <laughs> there's so much more I want to do with it, you know, I just want to play with these trees a bit more. And also when you're drawing trees, remember that like so the branches kind of come in and out of the foliage as well. So that's what I tried to do on the front left tree, because you can actually see the branches all the way through. So that's always something that lends a bit more, I don't know what the word is like, not realistic, but it just looks a bit more um, authentic, I, I suppose. So here I am using the Sailor Fude again because I just wanted to darken up those front trees a bit and it's really cool to get a bit of a barky texture on the on the trees. And then I thought I'd get the white gel pen out. Uh, you can't really see it so well but just to get some road markings on I thought that might be quite fun to, to have. And now I'm just going in again with a bit of a darker shade. Also just tried to change up the, the shade of purple I was using a bit just to make it, you know, because it's not all one shade of purple. And then just doing a few sort of just very subtle splatters, you know. Uh, I think I went a bit too crazy with that on the urban sketch and it just made it look a bit too messy. Um, but I do think the splatters really add to the blossoms in movement and, and falling and that kind of thing. So I hope that was interesting for you guys to check out the difference between my urban sketch and then going home and just being considering it a bit more. And now I think if I went back again and did an urban sketch, there'd be some different things I might do. But there might be some things that I would keep from the urban sketch because I do like the, the energy of the urban sketch is really nice. Um, so let me know in the comments below guys, which do you prefer? Duncan prefers the urban sketch. I think I slightly prefer the sketch I did at home, but I think that if I blended the two together, then I'd I'd have something I'm like super, super happy with, you know, but I'm I'm happy with both of these sketches. I think they remind me of the place that I was in and how magical I found seeing the jacaranda trees. So, and all good learning experience as well. So I hope you enjoyed uh, checking out this video guys and I will see you in the next one.